Hey, Levina. Hey. It's hey, so Patrick. nice. <laughs> hey. So nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So to give some context on why you're here and why I think you fit the description, the most interesting person in the room is I saw you being coached and coaching as part of a group experience, a digital experience. And you asked a question to another participant that was so sharp and so like head on that if it hadn't been asked with full kind of compassion, like I could feel like how that your the poignancy of the energy that like it was so crystal clear the and it like hit me like a jolt almost like wow that's a level of realness that I ra rarely see almost like a superpower for and you work as a coach too so that kind of directness that kind of sharpness is that something that you um have heard before, or am I the first one to point this out? <laughs> Thank you for that reflection. And it is something that I've heard before. I've had my coaching described as laser, and it is something that I intentionally work on, the depth of my listening and the way that I dance with people in conversation. And I'm curious, we, you and I actually haven't talked very much about this moment from your perspective. I'm curious, the, the sharpness of the question and the compassion with which it delivered really resonated with you. And do you remember the content of that moment? I don't. I just remember like, like if that wasn't delivered in the right way, that sharpness, that laser, you know, because I think, you know, we're both coaches. So those kind of insights or you know the perspectives that we bring to people like in my perspective in personal growth like the more it kind of hurts like the message not the way it's delivered but like the more it like it stings like ah then i like for me that's that's what i kind of know i need like ah then i know that it, like that hit something that i need to look at so i just think it was Maybe, you know, that's something, that kind of level of realness is something that I appreciate highly. But I also believe it takes a, a lot of courage from a person to pose those questions that are so direct. And I don't think that's something that, well, some people can have it naturally. But I think my question would be like, have you practiced a lot of courage? to be able to post that kind of lasered directness in your questions to your clients? Mm. In the context of working with clients, which I think is a really specific kind of context because there's an agreement in place that my role is to be your outside pair of eyes and ears in service of whatever it is that you're creating. And in that kind of relationship, it doesn't serve the client and it doesn't serve the relationship for me to hold back any insights that I see. So there's a specific kind of context there that's different from the agreements in a lot of different kinds of relationships. I would say absolutely courage is a part of that. And I think the bigger thing that drives me in reflecting what I see as clearly as I can is a devotion to the people that I work with. And I'm sure, I imagine you and I both have experienced this ourselves, if not for the work of coaching, there are so many different aspects of our lives that would not be as they are today. And I resonate so much with what you shared that these like moments of having something reflected that stung or that like, honestly, I just felt so cringe about. My coaches were often the only people in my life that were willing to say those things to me as directly as they did. 
And I would not be the person that I am if not for that, if not for those conversations. Mm. And so I think it's such a gift. Yeah, for sure. Why are you, how long have you been a coach for? Professionally about five years. Mm. And why did you decide to become a coach? Mm. I think the high level answer for that is I do really truly believe that working with a great coach is one of the most incredible gifts that we can experience. And I've had that experience time and time again. And it is the perfect alignment. It's one of one of the most perfect alignments of my gifts and how I see that I can contribute great value to humanity. That's beautiful. And what are your gifts, the way you see it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I think you and I probably share a number of gifts. I'm curious to hear how you would describe yours. Um, it's so simple. And yet one of the most profound skills that we can develop and continue to develop. I think one of my great gifts is the way that I listen. I'm often listening on so many different levels and layers. What are the words that you're saying? What is the meaning that you're unconsciously trying to convey behind the words? What is the meaning that you're associating with the story that you're telling me? What are you communicating with your body language? Yeah, it's like... I resonate a lot with that and I think it's there are all these layers that you need to tap into to be able to decode the kind of layers of the personality that has been programmed so that in the best case the person that you work with you decode so much that they access their own like source code like you decode everything else and what's left is there like when when you get access to your source code then you're kind of free to create yourself and manifest yourself in any way you like but as long as you have those layers left right they're going to stand in the way until you decode them so i i relate a lot to um what you're sharing there i love that analogy <laughs> it's very specific and i get it it's great yeah but then you have had to have that experience you know with other coaches or in your personal development that level of self-awareness, I guess, and I'm not saying I'm, you know, Gandhi or Buddha or anything else. I'm just talking about a relative level of self-awareness that is kind of the currency, I guess. We do we do the work on ourselves to be able to be the best kind of coaches that we can for other people. Yeah, you asked, I don't know if you asked or if you were curious, but you, you asked about what my gifts are, perhaps, and I started thinking about that, so I just... And I think in coaching, I think you tapped into it in another sentence, but I think when something is in total alignment, as you said, I think the line between who you are and what you do is erased. So, and then everything you do becomes an authentic expression of who you are. So I think the greatest gift I have in coaching is... being my authentic self like I have a responsibility to show up as my authentic self because I think that's the the gift I can give to other people is embodying someone who's to a, to a large extent is just I'm just being who I am and I think that's the gift um
And I think there's one more part, which is, I don't know if I told you this story, but I once had a, a sweatshirt and it had a small uh, like sticker on it. And it said, I suffer from realness. And um, I think that's one thing like I, I can't, like, I, I, I think that's actually what I do. Like I suffer from realness. I can't, if it, if it's not aligned, if it's not authentic, like I have to, I have to be real. Like I like almost compulsively have to be real with myself and anything that isn't aligned, like I need to sort out and, you know, so I think also helping my clients in their journey to become more of their authentic self, to become real, like real as in embodied and real as in being and acting in truth, your own truth and living in that integrity. So I think that's kind of my side of it. But I don't know, the story changes all the time. <laughs> <laughs> True. Like that's, that's where I am now. <laughs> it sounds like you and maybe your clients have a low tolerance for the discomfort and the pain of being out of alignment. And that's a beautiful way of, of putting it. And I think perhaps that's where my kind of um, awakening journey started like eight years ago. I, like there was so much in my body that was sending me these signals of like, I well, so that was kind of, I, I truly I believe that's a great way of putting it. How did you become aware of that? Um, so it was like the things that used to be meaningful for me, the things that used to give me joy, they didn't anymore. So I was at loss, kind of. I, everything in my old reality, you know, didn't do the job anymore. So I know I need, I, I knew I needed to step out of that. And I didn't know into what I was stepping out into. Um, but I just knew I needed to step out of my old reality, like many parts of my old reality. I, I, I brought my wife and my cats, but <laughs> many other parts that, you know, I left behind. And we moved to this island called Gotland in the Baltic Sea where we live now. And it's basically been a five, six years journey of, you know, having experiencing and stumbling and falling and getting up again and learning and like course correcting and more and more kind of honing in through having a multitude of experience on like on a deeper kind of level, like who am I, what are my values, what's important to me. Um, so that has been the journey for me into coaching and it kind of naturally then transcended into me using the, the insights and experiences that I've had to help other people in their, in their journey. And what has been your, has there been a, like a watershed moment in your story, your history, your experience where you've had this, like, well, this isn't working any, anymore. Like I need to step out of this. Have you done any kind of big pivots? So many. <laughs> <laughs> I do think one of the ways that I think about um, the story of my life is that it unfolds in books and chapters. And there was absolutely a huge turning point between the first and the second book. And that moment was actually a huge contributor to my interest in continuing to work with coaches and eventually becoming a coach myself. And I would say the big distinction that woke me up was really getting that I was responsible for so much of the things that I said that I didn't want in my life. 
I woke up to the fact that I wasn't a victim of all of my relationships and of my work and of my health that I had actually created it. And I asked this question about how did you wake up to the discomfort of being out of alignment? Because I think that moment is so meaningful in the story of so many of our lives, mm. right? We often talk about the, the, the discomfort and the fear of moving towards the thing that we're called to because it's out of our comfort zone and it's edgy and it requires courage. And I don't as often hear us talk about the other side of that, which is the discomfort of staying where you are and continuing to brace yourself against all of what is not in alignment. I remember I grew up in America. I grew up in New York, which is a very fast paced city that's so centered around achievement. And I have immigrant parents who very much saw high achievement as the path forward to a better life. And I remember in my 20s, the very first time that I put myself in a room to see what I couldn't see about my own life, I was driven by wanting to have a breakthrough in my career. I remember thinking at that time, I was like, there's, I've hit a ceiling and I just absolutely don't know what it is. And I don't know how to achieve. I can't see how I can achieve more. And at that time, I was so asleep to all of the numbness in relationships the numbness to my own sense of disconnection and discomfort, the numbness to the fear that I felt. I was on this path of achieving more and more in my career, but I was so afraid to ask the questions around whether or not I was doing the work that was really meaningful and fulfilling because I had a sense that if I ever addressed those questions, many things would need to shift. There was this continuous discomfort and pain in my relationship with my parents and my family. And I tolerated that. For the vast majority of my life, I learned to tolerate that. And I remember thinking to myself when I walked into this room, all I want is to get to the next step of my career. All this other stuff, it's not great, but it's okay. And now I look back at that and I cannot imagine how I could have, how I could ever say that again. I have such a low tolerance for the discomfort, the dis-ease of things being out of alignment now mm. because I saw how much impact the ripple effect of that had in my life and the life of everyone around me. And of course, in that weekend, I mean, I got some insights about my career and my leadership and how to move it forward. But the thing that I really had to look at was all of the stuff that I had been avoiding for so long. Mm. And that opened the door for me to create shifts in places that I never thought were possible. And, you know, at that moment, those insights, and as you, I guess, been on a continuous journey of, you know, healing and reprogramming yourself, what has been the, how have you been able to let go of the programming and the parts and the history that no longer serves you? What has been the, how have you been able to let go of that? My answer for the moment is 
really actually influenced by what we were talking about just before we started the recording, which is I've just fostered and adopted a puppy. And I'm learning so much about training behavior as a result. And I'm also learning a lot about impulse control <laughs> as a result. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure that there are that what I've done is let go of old behaviors. Mm -hmm. I think I've been engaged in a very long process of recognizing reactions and impulses and training myself to slow down and then retraining my behavior given certain circumstance, like whatever the circumstances are, whatever the trigger is. Yeah. Interesting. Like when I look at my kind of path since that, you know, stepping out of my old reality, I, a big part of my process of letting go is because I, in my perspective, all the like beneath the layers of stories, the mental stories, and there's also like everything, our thoughts, our beliefs, and our emotions, they're all connected energetically. So, and I was so disconnected from my authentic self back then. And the way for me that is played out has been through grief. Mm. So I've been grieving continuously, like for six, seven years. And that has allowed me to connect to my, to my heart, to my, to my authentic self, to the soul level or whatever you want to call it, but that deeper part of me. And I don't know, I'm curious to hear your perspective on, in my perspective, we all have attachments. Like as a kid, you need to attach to things. You attach to your parents, you attach to like, you see a thing, you know, you see a baby, they attach, like they grab onto things with their hands. Like they, and when you take a toy from a baby, they, they cry, you know, <laughs> and I think in my perspective, every attachment that I've had to let go of has come with grief. So I guess that's why I asked you from the context of letting go is because in my journey, the letting go has been an energetic and emotional, like feeling it fully and just letting it pass so that like I can be energetically in, in flow again. Mm. But the way you speak about it sounds more like a conscious kind of, I mean, and that's part of it for me too, but it sounds more like a conscious reprogramming rather than an emotional. I think it's a both and. At the beginning that's at the beginning of this conversation we talked about the gift of precision and i think part of the journey to developing the gift of precision has to do with discipline and there's a relationship between discipline and control and i would say precision discipline control great gifts and strengths of mine. Yeah. And every gift and strength we can overuse and then it can become a challenge and a weakness. Yeah. And sure. yeah. And I remember, I mean, I'll for, I think be in this journey of learning about the strength and learning how to use this strength effectively and learning when I've crossed the line. And it's no longer been useful for a long time. And to come to your insight about letting go and grieving, it's like there are circumstances in my life where I could see that the overuse of control was not only not useful,
but harmful. And that way of leading was the best way that I had developed over time. Certainly a younger version of me came up with this method and I had been using it unconsciously for as long as I had been. Yeah. And I remember that moment, a number of those moments of insight where I could see, oh, this is not working. This is actually hurting. And there is a moment of choosing to let that behavior go. And there is a moment of grieving all so much that is associated with that behavior. Yeah. And I think, you know, there, there comes to this point where you need the level of self-awareness to see that pattern so you can choose wisely and, you know, usher in a new behavior and new behavioral patterns. But I, I, I think, that, you know, since we're both coaches, I'm also curious because this sharpness that you and perhaps I, that we share in this way of seeing people, if it's not paired with because that's the mind, it's like highly focused. Like if, if we don't pair that with heart, I think that's where that, um, that skill or that asset can, you know, flip over to not being an asset, but being a liability. So how do you stay connected to your heart when you coach mm -hmm. or in life? Like how do you get access to your, how do you access your heart center? If people don't know that we care about them, it doesn't know it doesn't matter what we can see. One thing I continually come back to is that the best part of being a teacher is being a student. And one of my favorite things and also i think one of the most challenging things about this profession is you're constantly working with people who are a mirror for you and whatever is happening with my clients i use as a prompt to look in my own life and see where that's alive for me and where I've struggled with whatever it is that they might be struggling with in the present or in the past. And it's this slowed down process of connecting to the compassion for myself and connecting to the compassion for my clients and also remembering We all are walking each other home. <laughs> yeah. Ramdas quote. Yeah. <laughs> I love Ramdas. Or maybe you haven't heard of Ramdas. Maybe you that's your quote in your experience. No, no. That's Ram <laughs> that's Ramdas. <laughs> yeah. I um I had um I went to a three day Vipassana course and mm -hmm. with my wife and we brought along a invited a friend to come along too because he's also a Vipassana meditator. And we came there and I'd been uh, up in a lot of work, you know, just being very busy, like heady. And I noticed as soon as I met my friend, who's a dear friend, he's very, you know, he, um, there's not much about him that can upset you. Let me put it that way. And, and I felt immediately like, oh, there's something here. Like I'm annoyed with him. Like there's, there's something going on energetically in me. Um, and then we spent three days together in silence, you know, with many other people. And every time I saw him, I was so triggered. Like I, I felt resentment, like I didn't want to be close to him. One time I stood at, on the grass and someone walked behind me and I felt my pulse race and I turned around and it was my friend. So it was this energetic 
kind of, you know, like a the wrong side of a magnet. Like I didn't want to like, but I, I knew this was mine. So I, you know, for these days I sat with this, you know, for these eight to ten hours per day of meditation, I had this in my in my mind. And on the final meditation before we were allowed to speak again, because you were silent for the whole time. This insight landed in me is, is when I when I set him free, when I allow, allow him to be who he is, when I set him free, I set myself free. And when that insight just came, my whole system just like released and I bawled my eyes out. Like I tried to be quiet in this meditation hall with hundreds of, others, <laughs> hundreds of other people. But, you know, when you cry like that, like there's snort coming out of your no nose, like that. <laughs> it's everything. But then after that, we came out and, you know, this was the first time we were allowed to speak to each other again. And I was, I just could look at him with love. And I was so relieved that I've been able to get to this deep insight in myself. So it just goes, just a, a story, an anecdote on the notes of, you know, everyone is a mirror, but I, I think I do believe that there's the beauty in when you allow someone else to be who they are, you allow yourself to be who you are. You don't, when you no longer hold them hostage, you don't hold yourself hostage. Mm. Can I ask you a question about this? Of course, go ahead. Story and experience what was it that you found so repellent well he was kind of just being this i was triggered by his like sen like identity like oh look at the trees like oh look at the sky it's so beautiful like and i was like oh, like because i I have a hard time with people being in a spiritual identity. And of course, it's because I have been in a spiritual identity myself. And once you've been in an identity and you step out of it, the more you want to distance yourself from that, like you no longer see yourself as that. But of course, this was not fully, you know, processed, apparently, since I needed three days of, <laughs> of 10 hours per day meditation to, to uh, come to this place. But, um, you know, he was just being himself, where he was on his journey, as you know, I am too. And we are all we're, you know, this is we all have our journey and everyone is a mirror. So but yeah, the clients are also a great way of seeing where you're out of integrity with yourself, like you give advice or you give perspectives and you're like, well, uh, I need to hold myself accountable to that, the same thing. I mean, you can, of course, bring perspectives that are specifically about the clients, but I think so many things, like 95% apply to my own life as well. The kind of clients you work with, have they changed over time? I think we're in the midst of a shift. And I think that shift really reflects a shift that I'm experiencing in my own life. Most of the work that I've done to date with clients we've described through our conversation. When the discomfort or the pain of being out of alignment is great enough that it prompts my clients to start to take a look at the things that they've been avoiding looking at and start to create transformation. That's been what a lot of my work has been focused on, helping people get into alignment. Mm. 
and create alignment in all areas of life. And I still do that work. Absolutely. And I think there's a new component that I'm seeing with a lot of the people that I'm working with and the people who I'm having conversations with. I think of my coaching is I often meet people as they're climbing the first mountain of their life and they're nearing a peak and that first mountain is the mountain of achievement. And as they ascend to a peak, we might walk up the last bit together. They realize I'm not experiencing the sense of fulfillment that I thought I would have from being on this peak. And what? There's another mountain behind this one. <laughs> Mount authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> Mount true self. <laughs> yes. And that I think is really the journey of authenticity. It's the journey of fulfillment. And I'm also discovering for many of my clients, it's the journey of contribution. Hmm. And specifically, a lot of my clients have art and thought leadership that they are ready to contribute. Mm. And so many of them would say, I'm living in terms of like family, career, health, community, partnership, love. I'm living the life that I've always dreamed of. Now what? And that now what has a pattern of being a book, a screenplay, a like podcast, a talk, something that shares ideas in the world that utilizes their creativity to share ideas in the world. Hmm. It's so interesting. That's the exact, like the now what is generally what I describe as like, that's where I can come in and start doing the work too. With Like there has to be some kind of symptoms of an awakening or realizing that because I think what you, you know, this Mount achievement often it comes from the programming that we've received from parents, family, culture, like everything outside of ourselves that we had to learn in order to function in the world and like be a, a contributing part of society. And then you come to that point And the reason you're not fulfilled is because that's not who you really are. So I think that that that's where the path of true self discovery kind of starts. Have you read the uh, Rick Rubin's um, The Creative Act? Not yet. Have you? Yes, I just finished it. It's a beautiful book. And I think, you know, to kind of chime in on what you're um, doing with your clients, I do believe that in the end, when we come closer to our authentic selves and our gifts, and when we are able to transmute our wounds and pain into creativity and self-expression, um, like, I think that's the essence of being human. Um, I think perhaps, I don't know, but perhaps that's why we're here in the end to express ourselves, to, to like embody the most authentic version of ourselves and constantly kind of reiterate that constantly kind of, you know, just continuing the process of unfolding. And I think the, it's hard to do that without finding some kind of authentic self expression. And it can be entrepreneurial, it can be art, it can be anything. But I also think more and more about personal development as an art form. Like I know there's science to personal development and you can, you know, there's proven things. 
but then again like every human being has this unique composition of consciousness that they have to figure out and decode um but it's like i don't know about you but sometimes when someone says something that is so the essence of wisdom or an insight that hits me like poetry i know it sounds like geeky like such a <laughs> personal development nerd but i authentically mean i feel that like i when when my coach like i, I remember he told me something i was like that's poetry that's what you're expressing there it's so to the point like and when that when someone uses language to to hit something within you that resonates that makes you feel something be it in music be it in as a coach be it as a writer a podcast or whatever it is like that's where resonance come from i guess i don't know i'm thinking out loud living <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you do know, isn't that what poetry is? A dance with language to express something from our experience or something from our perspective mm -hmm. that can resonate deeply as art with another human being. Yeah. Another perspective on that, which I use a lot in my coaching is when I talk, when people speak out, I encourage them to have an internal awareness so like as they speak like notice when that hits something emotionally in you because that's the portal to a part of yourself that you haven't yet accessed so you can also do it with kind of you know with yourself almost like you sp but you need someone to to hold that space so you can sp because you don't speak to yourself the same way as you speak to someone else but usually when your language hits something like hits a note within you that's a portal to something and i mm -hmm. love coaching that way tell me about the work that you do with your clients yeah if i only knew <laughs> 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 so um, much truth in that yeah no because there is truth in that because I see how I help people shift into a new paradigm, a new reality, a new way of seeing things. And I don't know, like at all times, I don't know what it is. But I have, my best friend says, if everyone had a best friend like you, we wouldn't need coaches. And I think there's a beauty to that because it's the power of authentic, deep, real conversations where someone is completely safe to share the things that they don't think they're okay to share or that they're ashamed of or whatever it is um and i think you know just like with human like when we're young what do we do we emulate the people we have around us that's what we do and i think as a coach like the coach I work with now, Byron, it's by working with him, I get to embody something. I get to like emulate and see like a level of authenticity and depth and realness that like I crave. And when I get to step into that with someone else, it's like, it goes beyond intellect. It goes beyond reading a book. It's the energetic resonance and the transformation that person like it, it that energy is kind of transferred into you and you step into this bigger version of yourself which sets you on a trajectory that you couldn't do on your own and i think that's the work you know i do too from my side of things i that's something along those lines but i do think at the core of it is most people are so programmed to hide parts of themselves because they don't think it's okay to be who they really are or they're afraid to upset people and they have all these insecurities that they covered up with an ego self so most people most people have never experienced that it's okay to like be fully themselves to speak their truth to say what they feel 
and letting other people think, feel whatever they think and feel about that. And I think the journey I've been on has been, I, for a long time, I tried to perfect myself. And, and that's just another ego adventure because I was really running away from the parts of myself that needed the love and the acceptance. I think acceptance is the first thing you need, like the parts that you, you don't think are okay. If you can know those parts of you and see those parts of you, like the shadow side of you and give those parts acceptance and you integrate those parts in yourself, then it just becomes I think it's it sounds unprofound, but it is profound that like if you feel okay with who you are, like really, I'm okay. You feel that you're okay. That goes a long way in my perspective. And I like, you know, speaking of the the method I use with my clients, as I say that, I feel it touches like the deepest point of me. I feel like almost a bit of a tear in my eye around it. <laughs> so, and I think it's because I feel a lot of gratitude at this point for, you know, having done the work to embody more and more that I, I'm okay. I'm okay. Like... <laughs> the most profound things are often so simple and one of the things I really appreciate about being in conversation with you is the beauty of your presence and I'm really struck by it right now the resonance of I don't know so much of your story and yet I can feel the depth behind what those words mean thank you and i think that's the power of being seen to being seen you know at your deepest point you know i'm here and i allow myself to feel what i feel and <laughs> It's okay. And um, as you see, I think this is why grief is an entry point to your heart. Like when you allow to go to feel that deepest part of yourself, the, the part of yourself that you haven't allowed yourself to feel. Like in, Swe in Swedish, the word knowing yourself and feeling yourself is the same. So I think you need to feel yourself in order to know yourself. Um, and, you know, in this process of walking each other home, I guess what we're also learning is who we are on that deepest level, that essence. And, you know, it's that source code, right? When you access that deepest part of yourself, then, you know, to tap into what you said about your coaching, when you're tapping into the deepest part of yourself and you allow, allow that to be expressed in the world, it can be like this in a conversation, it can be a podcast, it can be that you paint, whatever it is. But then, come, then comes the next layer, which is about exposing the part of yourself and allowing that to be seen to the world. That's also a scary fucking part of the journey. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is, and I think so much of that is a process of surrender. And I think there's something really counterintuitive about surrender that I've learned, which is surrender is actually a powerful access point to reclaiming your energy. Like, 
there's one aspect of the journey that's about me being okay with me and that's forever ongoing. And then there's another aspect, which is I allow you to think whatever you will think and I will not attempt to misuse my control because it really, we can't control what other people think. We only think that we might be able to expending a massive amount of energy <laughs> along the way to try to protect ourselves from experiencing other people thinking. Yeah. It, it takes so much energy to try to maintain the idea and the identity that you've created and trying to control other people's idea of who you are that's a herculean task no wonder it takes a lot of energy out of you totally no wonder you're exhausted so all the time yeah and i think such a much more powerful use of that energy is to internally resource our sense of safety and that comes back to me being okay with me Am I still okay with me when you think that I'm too much? Yeah. Can I still be okay with me when you think that I am full of myself? It's a journey. That one is a journey still for me. I, um, I have the intention to post on LinkedIn like every weekday. I've been away for a while. I need to do some deep inner work and process things and kind of um, figure some things out. But I'm back again. Uh, and the interesting thing is I've been posting on social media for like two years. And I spoke to my wife about it this morning. I felt there was like Rick Rubin says like success is putting it out there. It's not how it's received. Success is putting it out there. And I think that's a beautiful way of saying it. He also said like the, the price you pay is vulnerability. Um, so I've been posting now for, for a week again, and I felt something like deep inside. And I, I spoke to my wife about it this morning. We sat outside and asked if I could, you know, if she could just listen to me and because I felt there was something that was sitting deep inside of me. And I still have a very hard time about crickets in social media like not getting the approval and likes not intellectually i'm not but there's i still feel it like energetically in my body because i am putting myself out there i'm sharing my authentic beliefs and opinion not opinions but perspectives and i realized that i deep down have this core belief still which is very interesting which is that no one cares so every time that happens, it, it's interpreted through the filter that no one cares. And it activates like this deep like pain in my core. And as I shared that with her, I once again, I started crying. I cry a lot. I guess you noticed that. <laughs> but that is my way of embodying the insight. Like when I access the emotion and I can process it and I use my, my head and my mind to kind of make sense of what I'm feeling and sharing that. So, you know, just for me, that's a big part of the journey. It's just like standing like, well, success is putting it out there. And the only measurement for me is like, am I authentic? But at the same time, it fucking hurts. But that's part of the journey. You know, it's just gotta, you know, I guess gotta take that stab into my solar plexus until it doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> 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 I love that you allow yourself to cry and be witnessed crying. I really do. Thank you. I don't think I have a choice, Livina. It's who I am. I think it's powerful. It's such an expression of, I'm okay. I'm good with me. Yeah. Can I ask you on a bit of a different note, but one of the things that I think many people struggle with in the coaching journey and me as well is 
how you value yourself like how you can command um investments from your clients that are in par with how one values um your skills and assets uh, and the transformation you can offer the clients i have this immense power in my coaching like it's transformational i see the insights that occur in my clients and how it sh shifts for them but still i recognize that so much of my mental energy as i create offerings for or um you know packages for my clients so much of my energy is still consumed by how will they perceive me if i command this price like i don't feel i'm worth it but how has your journey been with valuing your coaching abilities and commanding those high tickets that also makes your clients become more committed to the work well the one that i felt the most energy behind was when you shared i struggle to feel like i'm worth it and I've definitely had that thought and I've definitely time and time again had that pop up and struggled with it myself. And where I sit now is when I go there, it's a result of confusion. confusion about what the conversation about the fee is really about because the conversation to me about the fee for working with me as a coach has nothing to do with me as a person and sometimes i slip i i'm human sometimes i still slip into that misconception, especially given all of the talk over the last few decades about charge what you're worth and make sure that you're valuing yourself. And I, while that's a popular idea, I think that's a misconception. In what way? My worth as a human being has nothing to do with how much people pay me. I don't think a teacher is less worthwhile. I mean, in America, we pay teachers terribly. Mm. And I don't think a teacher is less worthwhile as a human being than the CEO of a bank. So I am working not to apply that logic to myself, that my worth has anything to do with how much people pay me for services. When my ego gets loud about that, what I realize is I've slipped out of a conversation about being of service to the client because that's really what the conversation is about. What's important is not only that we see the value in the coaching relationship that's being proposed, but the client sees it. And so I might think to myself, like, I'm just going to make up a random number, like, um, you having a best-selling book is absolutely worth $50,000 of investment. Are you kidding me? Like the value that you would get from that, the community that you would build, the interesting people that you would meet, the opportunities that that would open the door to, the fact that this body of work that like you've probably felt a connection to for a long, long time is finally expressed in the world, the identity shift that you get. Like for me, that would be a no-brainer. Of course I see the value. Do I see it as a 10x return? Probably more. Now, that's all great. And if the client that I'm talking to does not see that value for themselves, then it's not the right fit. And of course they're going to balk at the number. Yeah. And I think... As you charge higher and higher fees, more and more people will say no. It's 
part of the nature of commanding a high fee. Yeah, and just the energy that you know you spoke about the uh, all the possibilities around that book, you know, it just reminded me of in the end in coaching, everyone is gonna come up to the edge of their fears. And when you and in order to move through that fear, I think our job as coaches, in my perspective, is to create an excitement that is bigger than the fear. Um, because I think that's, you know, in, in this, you know, if we follow our, our deepest desires, our passions, the things that have always been there, but, you know, kind of suppressed or hidden under layers of who we believe ourselves to be, if we as coaches can help people access the, those deepest desires and longings and go for them, that is the true value, I think. Yeah. And it's not the way that most of us are wired to think. We think in terms of easily measured return, which is financial for the most part, because there's a number and it's easy to see. But if I think about the greatest value of all the coaching that I've received, it's not the amount of money that I've made. I would not, I would be willing to give up that money, the income, but I would never be willing to exchange the transformation and all of the relationships in my life, the transformation in my own acceptance of self, the way of being that I've developed. That is worth more than a hundred times what I've invested in coaching. And it's harder to measure. We don't have an easy system for saying the ROI on the return for my, or the ROI on my investment of like a thousand dollars in coaching was like, I built a more loving and connected relationship with my son that was like, I spent 80 more hours with him than I would have. How do you measure the love? How do you measure the connection? I think as a as a species, we could get better at that. And within our profession, we can definitely get a lot better at that. Hmm. I think that's a kind of beautiful way to go full circle on this one. Um, if people are interested in knowing more about you or working with you, where can they find you? They can head to my website, lavina-lee.com. I don't have a big internet presence at the moment. So the best way is to send me an email. To what address? Hello at lavina-lee.com. And Lee is spelt L-I, right? Yes, that's yes. right. Well, you do have a big presence in the room. <laughs> and I'm so grateful that you took your time to have this conversation with me. Really, I feel uh, expanded around my heart from having this conversation with you. Thank you. Me too. Such a pleasure spending this time with you. Thank you for the gorgeous space that you cultivate in conversation. Thank you, Lavina. <laughs>